Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that are here in our service today. In fact, behind me, in just a moment, we're going to have a bunch of mothers coming out with their families on stage because we're going to do something really cool today as a church family to kick off Mother's Day service. Uh, we're going to have a, a child dedication, which really, to be honest with you, is also a parent dedication. And I just wanted to begin today by kind of casting a vision for us as a church for what these families are doing this morning. Because I think it's so important, I think it's so cool. These families are basically declaring before you, our church family today, and saying, you know what, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, and as for me and my family and my kids, we're going to point them in the direction of Lord God Almighty. And we are going to love him and to serve him all the days of our life. And so this moment for these families today is one of those moments I, I like to picture. You're taking a stake and you're planting it in the ground and you're saying, as for me and my family, this is the direction we're going. We're going to raise these kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so uh, we're going to get to do that, and you're going to actually get to be an active part of that in just a few minutes. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Corey Bricks, our children's minister. He's going to introduce you to these families, tell you a little bit about, about them, and then um, I'll come and pray at the end. Corey? Uh, thank you, Eric. If I can go ahead and have the first family come on up, and I'll introduce them to you guys. But yeah, this is a great special moment. So this is Briggs, Rosine, and we have Kyle and Jenna Rosine. We have Brock right there, uh, big brother. And they picked a life verse for um, Briggs, Colossians 3.23, and whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And they also picked some traits that they would like to pass on to their, to their children. And this one is really, really important. They want hardworking, to be courageous, to be kind, and to be driven. So I think that's a great thing. So let's give this family a round of applause. All right. Thank you, guys. Our second family, come on up here. He's a little shy. That's okay. I understand. I get nervous, too. She's ready to go. All right. This is Brighton Dryling. We have Lakin and Marissa Dryling as parents. And we have Truett. There you go. He came out now. That's good. And the life verse they picked is Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And some character traits they'd like to pass on to her would be to be full of grace, joyful and loving, strong, enduring when facing all life's trials, to have wisdom and to be a shining light. Amen. Let's give this family a round of applause. Our next family come forward. We have Hudson Marie Wilsick. We have Troy and Haley as the parents. And if you didn't know, they have a baby sister um, on the way. So very good. Uh, the life verse they picked for, for Hudson is Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's great. And another um, trait they would like to pass on to, to Hudson here is kindness, faithfulness, courage, be, to be passionate and to be gra show gratitude. Very good. Let's give this, this family a round of applause. Our next family we have here is little Lexi Gabriella Nakvinda, and we have parents Zach and Kayla, and we have Lily and Ella as the siblings. Very good. And we have Psalms 139, um, verse 13 through 14 as your life verse. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That's a great verse. And some traits they would like to pass on to her is faithfulness, to be compassionate, selfless, loving, and humble. Very good, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. I'm going to skip up this side. <laughs> and here we have Miss Charlotte with her nice little bow. Uh, Lottie Thurman Lang. She goes by Lottie. Very good. Uh, we have Michael and Carrie Lang. And we have siblings down here. We have Tatum and Hattie. Very good. You guys look great. Uh, the verse they picked for her is Deuteronomy 31, 6. To be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or nor forsake you. And that's a great verse as well. And some traits they like to pass on is to be cour courageous, to show kindness, to show gratitude, to have generosity, and of course, love. Very good, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. In our next family, we have little Raylynn Verzoni here, 
And we have Ian and Victoria as the parents, and the baby sister also on the way. A little heads up in case you didn't know. Um, the life verse is from Proverbs 22.6. It says, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Very good. And then some traits they'd like to pass on to her is, as well as to be joyful, to so, show self-control, to show kindness, faithfulness, and a willingness and ability to work. Amen on that one. Very good. Let's give them a round of applause. I had a privilege to uh, meet with this family, these families about two weeks ago at a class, and we just talked about the importance of you all being the spiritual leaders in your household. And so just like in Deuteronomy 6, Moses got forward and said, I wanted you guys to impress your faith on your kids' hearts, to show them what you believe so that they can go and live out their life when they get older. And so as parents, I want to ask you this commitment right here. Will you, as parents, love, serve, and obey the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength? Will you set the example that your child needs in speech and life and train your child in the way they should go? Even when they are older, they will not turn from it. If so, please repeat with me or say it out loud. We will with the help of God. Amen to that commitment right there. They're making this commitment right now to stand firm as a family and to show their belief in Jesus to their kids and pass that on. And so they need a circle of influence around them. They need family. They need friends. They need their church body to come around them as well. And so today, I want to ask you as family and friends in the church body, will you all surround them and love them and help pass on your faith, maybe in Sunday school class, maybe through a VBS or other activities, that you can impress this faith of Jesus onto them as well. And if so, please repeat after me, we will. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Eric to come forward again, and he's going to close us with a prayer of blessing over these families. Yeah, let's pray and go before the Lord right now. Lord God, we just so thankful for all these families. Lord, I'm thankful for the guts that I know that it takes to get up in front of the whole church family and to declare, hey, as for me and my house and my kids, we are going to serve the Lord and we're going to point uh, these children and grow them up in the faith and send them in, in your way, God, and to teach them your ways. And so, God, just so thankful for that. And, God, I just pray a special blessing on these parents. I know that parenting is, is such a, a journey, and I know at times it's hard. And so I pray, Lord, as a church family, that we would surround them with love and encouragement, that we would do our part to help raise these kids in a Christian community here in God's church, that as we, as we teach them at church camp or, or in Sunday school or at vacation Bible school or all the different ways we can serve in children's ministry, Lord, as we encounter these children, we would help uh, these parents to point them in your ways, Lord. And I pray for these families, for all the times that they're going to be on their knees praying, crying out to you, for all the times that are going to be really good, and for some of the times that are going to be really hard, God, that they would just always just, just stay in line with you and your will, and God, that they would always be a great example of what it means to be a Christian to their children. And God, that these children would walk in your ways all of the days of their life. God, we love you. We thank you for the hope and the strength and the power we have because of Jesus. And we pray this dedication in, in his precious name. Amen. Let's give these families a warm round of applause this morning. Amen. What a blessing it is for all of us to just be able to come together in the name of Jesus and celebrate this morning. I want to invite you, if you would, let's stand together and let's sing and rejoice in the name of the Lord. Together this morning, 
It's too late, hope is buried and dead in the grave. I'll speak your name. Yes, I'll speak your name. Because a song of thanksgiving is my battle cry. With joy as my weapon, I stand and defy the lie of the top with my hands lifted to the sky.
you in this moment. In the love of our Father, let's turn to one another and let's welcome each other here this morning. All right, if you'll begin to make your way back to your seats, I want to wish everyone, all the mothers that are here, a very special happy Mother's Day. And we, hey, hey, let's, let's just have all the moms stand up and we'll just give them a big applause. Let's have all the moms in the room stand up. We appreciate you because the rest of us wouldn't be here without you guys. So thank you guys. If you're brand new here today, this is your first time, we want you to uh, stop by one of our two welcome centers and we've got a gift that we want to give to you. And how that works, there's a little card here in the front, if you, uh, right there in the front of the pew, if you just fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us and then take that back and give that to the attendant there and they've got a gift bag that's got uh, some neat gifts in there, some information about our church. If you didn't pick one of these up on the way in, this is our bulletin. You can also scan that little QR code right there in front of you. We'll give you all the information that you need to know for this week. We've got quite a bit going on, as you would expect, at the end of the school year. Uh, our last Wednesday night of the spring semester is this Wednesday night, May 17th, and so that's when our groups and uh, children's ministry will conclude, but we are going to have a family night 
on May 31st. And so that will be a fun time. There's some information in the bulletin. And as always, you can scan, scan that, go to our, our website. Our Wednesday night summers will look a little different than they do during the school year. We're going to be having some uh, volleyball fellowship. I, I was choosing my words correctly. Volleyball fellowship. Uh, that we want to encourage you to come get acquainted, get to know each other, uh, have some fun. Even if you're not a volleyball player, we want to invite you to come and, and watch those that, that are volleyball players and have some, some neat time of fellowship. Uh, that will start June 7th. May the 20th, our Grace in Motion Dance Ministry is going to do their spring recital. And the tickets for that are $5. That's uh, May the 20th. Make sure I got that. May the 20th, correct. Tickets are only $5. You can pick those up in the Oak. We're continuing today in our series, Don't Give Up. There may be some of you this morning ready to, to just throw in the towel and just say, life has been too hard right now. We want to encourage you, don't give up. I want you to right now prepare your heart and mind to receive the message Pastor Eric has for for us today and just open up your heart to God's word. Well, again, do just want to begin this morning by saying happy Mother's Day to all the moms here. And thank you for making it a priority in your life and probably in your family's life to uh, be here in the house of the Lord on Mother's Day uh, to acknowledge Him as your Savior and Lord. And uh, we are continuing in our series uh, this morning called Don't Give Up. And if you have a Bible this morning, uh, I want to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to be. Uh, this morning, if you have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to get out your phone. Uh, if you have a tablet, an iPad, uh, just download the Oakwood app. Just search Oakwood Enid in your app store. And when you open the Oakwood app, if you go to sermon notes, all the scriptures and all the bullet points, everything will be there for you. The main thing that we want in these next few minutes this morning is for you to engage the Word of God. We believe the Word of God is living and active and has the power to change lives as well as eternal destinations. So it's super important that you uh, engage the Bible this morning. So whatever that means for you, maybe, maybe you're a note taker and you've got a, you know, a, a notebook or something. Maybe you take notes on your phone um, in the notes app. Maybe you want to take notes uh, in our app. Uh, there's a way for you to do that, but uh, just engage and hear from the Lord this morning um, from Hebrews chapter 12. Just to frame up uh, kind of where we've been, because I know last week we were off for graduation Sunday, uh, we have been looking at Hebrews 12 and Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is famously known as the Faith Hall of Fame, and we've been looking at faithfulness in the Christian walk. And, and, and it's, it's described as this race that we're running. And that we are called by God to finish, but not just finish, not like be the last one. Oh, hey, we crossed the finish line barely, but to finish strong, to finish well. And it begins our passage in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1. It begins with the word therefore, and it's talking about chapter 11. Therefore, because of all these saints in chapter 11. And we've talked about Abraham. Uh, the, the first week we talked about Abraham and how he was called to leave his country, his people, and his father's household and to go into some strange land that God was promising him. God was promising him, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, and you're going to be blessed by me, and you are going to have a worldwide blessing. We, we can study through the lineage of the Bible and understand it's Jesus Christ. That a worldwide blessing is going to come through your lineage, and so stay faithful and don't give up. In the second week, we, we talked about another character from, from uh, chapter 11, and, and, and he just gets one verse. It's, it's about Joseph, and we, under, we uh, studied and, and, and talked about God's providence, how God works through all circumstances in life, good circumstances, bad circumstances, circumstances that seem like they're out of control. No, 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 no. 
God's not out of control. God knows exactly what he's doing. And even in the chaos of a sinful world, God can still work his mission. And we saw that through the life of Joseph. And today we're just going to continue on this journey. And we're really going to drill down into some things that we need to do as Christians to finish our race well. And it all starts there in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. As the writer here implores us, as we walk out this process of sanctification in our life, don't give up up. Let's read it together. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd, cloud of witnesses, and that's all the people mentioned in chapter 11, he says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And I would add, so you don't give up. So let's, let's, let's talk about a couple things directly from this passage. I know we've read this passage every week uh, in this series, but let, let's, get, let's get into this just a little bit further today. And the first thing I want to share is this, that we are called there in verse 1 to throw off everything that hinders you following Jesus fully. You're to throw off everything that hinders you following Jesus fully. If something is in the way, you're to throw it off. Let's read the text. He says there in the second part of the verse, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Your hindrance gives us this idea that it's something that is an object in our way or it's something that we carry with us like extra weight. If you're going to go take off in a race this morning and you put on a backpack that had just say 50 pounds of weight in it, you are going to run your race differently with 50 pounds on your back than you are if you didn't have that backpack on. And I think that we can all acknowledge that and we understand as we go through life, there are things that hinder us from running the race faithfully in Jesus Christ. This is no way an exhaustive list this morning, but I want to share three things that I think uh, we can all relate to. The first one is stress, the anxiety, and the pressures of life. This can be a huge weight on a person. And sometimes when you're carrying this extra load of worry, anxiety, and those kind of things, it weighs you down and it makes you want to do what? It makes you want to stop. Stop running the race. It makes you want to not finish the race. And you have this stress and this anxiety, and it just has this tendency to just Put all of this weight upon you. Now, I want you to remember back. What was it like when you first accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord? Do you remember what it was like? I think it's good for us as Christians to remember that. I remember what it was like to to come out of that watery grave of baptism. and, And when you're raised to walk in newness of life. And you and I, we started our race then. And I bet for most of us, if not all of us, we ran freely. It was a lot easier to run the Christian race coming freshly off of that decision to give our lives to Jesus Christ. We were running that race, and we ran free, and we ran fast, and we were doing really well. And and you could probably remember back to that time, earlier in your life, where you're like, yes, I remember what it was like to be a new Christian. I remember what it was like to just run this race of faith and have all my faith, all all that I have, just have it in Christ Jesus and to just trust him completely. And I wasn't stressed out and I wasn't anxious. And it seems as we run longer with Jesus, Satan doesn't just go, oh, they're a Christian. I should leave them alone. No, that's not the way he works. He's a liar. He's a destroyer. And he wants to destroy the good work that Jesus is doing in your life. And so he comes against you. He comes against you and he keeps coming against you. And you go through things in your life that are hard sometimes, things that are stressful, some things that might give you anxiety, they might cause you to worry. And the writer here in Hebrews is saying, hey, throw off, what was the word in verse 1? Everything. Everything. Throw off everything that would hinder you, including the stress and anxiety of life. And I know how it is sometimes. Easier said than done, right? 
But with God's help, all things are possible. Some of you came in there this morning and you, you're stressed out financially. Maybe you're stressed about your mortgage. And you know, man, I, I just changed jobs. I'm getting less money at my new job. And we had all these bills hit. I had a car repair come up that I didn't see coming. We had to replace the freezer. Um, man, and everything is, is out of control pricing-wise. I mean, I go to the store every time. It's an extra 30 cents on every item. And it just adds up. And we have these these worries, this anxiety, this stress about money. For some of us, it's the biopsy results that we're waiting on. Yeah, we had a biopsy this week, and I'm waiting on the results, and it just weighs on me, and it's, it's hindering me. It's hindering me in my faith and running this race because I'm so focused on what, the anxiety and the stress and the worry that comes from that. Some of you, maybe it's a child. Maybe it's one of your children. Maybe it's an adult child, and you're watching them self-destruct right before your eyes. And you're so stressed out about it. You're so worried and anxious. And it could be a million other things. Maybe it's something at your job. Maybe it's a relationship that you're in. Maybe for some of you, if we're being 100% honest, it's the awkward thing that you're going to go to this afternoon as your whole family gathers to honor your mother, and yet there's strained relationships there. But whatever it is, these things have a way of putting pressure on us in life. And they become hindrances to running the race of faith. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says this to us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, let's just pause there for just a second. That's a little weird. Okay, Jesus just said, come to me if you are feeling weary and if you're feeling burdened and you got all these burdens that are on your back and I will give you rest and then he says take my yoke upon you okay you guys know what a yoke is right the, the visual image that, that you get from that is like a yoke of oxen that are tied together with this wood bracket thing that goes around their necks and and they're tied together and they're pulling and it's weight it's stuff that you've got to pull and Jesus says wait a second here Jesus says hey come to me and bring the weight of the world, bring your weariness and bring your burdens to me and I will give you rest. And if you take my yoke upon you and you learn from me, now listen to the rest of it. He says, come, come, he says uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Now listen to what he says about his yoke. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what he's saying there is the weightiness of stress and anxiety the weightiness of sinfulness in your life, the weightiness, the weight and the burden of not moving God's direction in your life is so much more a weight and so much more burdensome and stressful than the yoke that Jesus puts on you to live in righteousness and holiness. Sometimes I don't think we realize that. We think, man, following Jesus is such a burden. It's so hard. i got to fight this, this fight. i got to run this race against sin every day of my life. And Jesus says, hey, wait, with me as your running partner, it's light. It's easy. Don't be bogged down. Don't be burdened with it. And I know it's easier said than done because some of you come in here with a heavy load this morning. You, you have stress. You have pressure. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's anxiety or maybe it's shame, but Jesus says, hey, take my yoke, go my direction, take on my mission, and you'll find out that your life is actually lighter and easier. You will run freer with me and my yoke on you than you will with the burdens and the sinfulness of this world. Another area that hinders us is sin struggles and repercussions. The sin struggles that we have and the repercussions of the sins that we commit. The Hebrew writer here says that we need to throw off those things. Look at the wording of it there in verse 1. It says to throw off everything that hinders. And then he gets really specific. He's saying everything that hinders covers everything, right? Throw off the sin that, and, and everything that hinders. And then he gets really specific. He says, and the sin that so easily entangles. He gets real specific. He says, hey, throw off everything and sin. I'm going to mention that specifically. And notice how he describes it. Sin that easily entangles us. Isn't it amazing sometimes how we're going through our life and sin has this way of tangling us up and tripping us. Oh, some of us don't feel like we've tripped and fallen into sin. We, we wear it like a badge of courage, you know. 
In our culture today, yeah, I'm a self-made person. I live my life on my terms, whatever I want to do. And, but that's, that's not exactly what, what God is telling us to do. When he says, you take my yoke upon you, he's telling, telling you to leave your life of sin and to go his direction in life. And I know several of you are like, yes, I have a sin problem. Yes, I, I have been patterned this way. I've been conditioned by the world this way. Yes, I would love to say goodbye to sin. Yes, but how? How do we do that? How we do that is through repentance and confession and accountability. Repentance is turning away from your sin and going God's direction in life, taking on his yoke. Confession is that you would confess your sins to God. Now let me just challenge all of us this morning. When was the last time that you and God had a talk where you confessed your sins? The Bible says to do that. And the Bible says, if you confess your sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to purify you from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, that sounds really freeing. If I'm going to run a race, I, I think I want to run under those conditions of being forgiven and having the yoke of sinfulness be lifted because the yoke of Jesus is now upon me. And we are called to do this fiercely. And the writer in Hebrews here is actually imploring us to do this. Let's read one verse further than we did in the text earlier. Let's read Hebrews chapter 12, the next verse, verse 4. Right after he tells us to not grow weary and to not lose heart, he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. That's how serious it is. He says, hey, you haven't tried to walk away from the sin pattern in your life and to walk away from your sinfulness to the point of shedding of blood. You haven't tried to do that yet. You haven't, you haven't gone to the point of shedding blood, and part of that is because what? Jesus shed his blood for our sins, and if we accept his free gift of forgiveness, we know that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. But in Romans 6, it also reminds us, it says the Apostle Paul was talking to Christians there in Rome, and he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? I mean, more sin, more grace, right? And he answers back, and he says, by no means we died to sin. That's what led us down the path to destruction. How can we live in it any longer? And even though, as Christians, I know that we maybe haven't achieved our full sanctification and perfection in Jesus Christ. Righteousness and holiness should be on the increase in our life. It is evidence of the salvation that we claim to have in Christ Jesus. And so we are constantly working against things that hinder us, sin struggles and the repercussions of those sin struggles. And it's with intensity and maybe bleeding, according to verse 4, that we are called to resist it. And there's a reason, because... If you understand it fully, sin gets in the way. When you sin, it builds a wall up between you and God. And then listen to what else sin does. Sin builds up a wall between you and God and then tells you that God is the one who built the wall. Oh, if God didn't have rules and guidelines and laws, God's the one that built the wall. No, 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 no. God created you. Father knows what's best. No offense to the mothers today, but our Heavenly Father knows what's best. He is our creator. He knows what we need. He knows what we need to do. And so we need to listen to him. He didn't build the wall. He built a fence of protection around us if we'll just live and walk in his ways. Remember, sin's goal is always to separate us from God. And God's forgiveness is always to bring us back together. Another thing that hinders us in life is just the distractions of life. Just distractions. I, I find this more at work today in our culture and in the church as Christians than at any other time in history. And here's a couple truths about distractions. When a good thing or a fun thing becomes the main thing, and what I mean by that, the main pursuit in your life, then you are distracted. It could be a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It could be a fun thing. But when it becomes the main thing and it gets bumped up the priority list and you find that all of your money is going toward that, that all of your time is going toward that, that all of your attention is going toward that, and you see God and your relationship with God more and more diminished, folks, you are distracted. 
And here's another truth this morning. If the devil can't make you bad, then he'll make you busy. And when you're too busy for God, that's bad. You can laugh. It's okay. But it's the truth. Sometimes we just say, I'm just so busy. I can't attend Bible study. I can't connect with other Christians in a small group. I can't serve on a ministry team. I can't give attention every day to my faith and growth. I get up from the moment I get up in the morning till the moment I put my head on my pillow at night. There is no time and no room for eternity. (laughs) Ouch. There's no time or room for the things of God in my life, for what God wants for my life. No, no, no. I'm doing it my way on my terms, and as long as the devil keeps you busy, you're going to stay in that pattern. Maybe the things you're doing aren't bad. But if they're so busy, they take you and lead you away from God. You are not running the race. And you are not going to finish well. Now, like I said earlier, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is just a list of things that hinder us. There are other things that can hinder us. But remember, he says to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin. And then he goes on right after that and he says, run with perseverance the race marked out for you. Run with perseverance the race marked out for you. It says that right at the end of verse 1. That's kind of how he kind of wraps that verse up is that, hey, you're going to run and you're going to run with perseverance. If someone says, hey, you're going to need to run with perseverance, what are they saying? It's going to be hard. We don't have to persevere if it's not hard, right? Otherwise, they'd say, hey, run with a smile on your face and the wind at your back. That is not what he says. He says, run with perseverance perseverance the race marked out for you now you know what I love about that it says the race is marked out for us it's not some guessing game what does God want for my life if we read the word and we're a people of the Bible we can know exactly what God wants we know exactly what he wants for our life we it's not something we're supposed to figure out it is marked out for us we are not running aimlessly I used to have a joke when I was a youth minister I don't tell jokes anymore because I'm not a youth minister that's what makes youth ministry so cool. I mean, Jeremy last week, didn't he do a great job with the, with the grads last week? I appreciated that. But here, here's the fact is, I, I, and, and I used to make fun of this all the time until I had a, a daughter that ran cross country. But I used to make fun of cross country. I was like, these people run aimlessly. You know, and I used to do a joke. I used to say, you know, uh, cross country, you know, uh, that actually comes from two words, craw meaning to run, and scuntry, meaning without meaning or purpose. And so we craw scuntry, and we run without meaning or purpose. And I used to think, okay, that, you know, that's what it is, you know, because I'm not a runner, if you didn't know that. I don't know if you could tell by my physique or anything else about me, but not a big-time runner, okay? But I will tell you this, I have huge respect for people that run. I learned that early on in my marriage because my wife was a runner. I never understood it. She told me about it. And then she'd go out and do it. And I was like, why? <laughs> why, why would you just, you know, I'm going to go on a run this morning. Why? What did you do? What did you do wrong? <laughs> you know, it's like self-punishment. I mean, what is this? And early in our marriage, uh, she actually wanted to run a race. We were living in Fort Worth, Texas at the time. She wanted to run the Jingle Bell Run, okay? It's in downtown Fort Worth in December. It's cold. It was a little bit wet that day. Not like icy wet, but I mean, it was just cold and damp in the 40s. She takes off, my beautiful young wife on this race, it's a 5K, and it's going up and down, weaving all the downtown of Fort Worth. It's all decorated for Christmas, and it's real festive, you know, and they've got, you know, red Christmas punch at the stops, and, you know, they did, you know and she's running. And I, and I remember thinking, okay, I want to intercept her and see her on the race, and so the, the streets would kind of go like this, and so I was like, I'm going to go a couple blocks down, I'm going to intercept her here, and then try to be there at the finish line at the end, and so I'm running my own race, trying to catch her in the race. And I remember her coming down this street, and I'm like looking at her, I'm like, is that her? No, the, 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 yeah, that is her. And she has bloody knees, and blood is just running down her legs. And I'm like, what? You know, in my uh, protect your wife mode kicked in as a, as a young husband and and I I was just like oh my goodness and so she's running and she's like hey and I said you're bleeding you know stop you're like come here what's what's wrong and she's like I fell but I'm going to finish and I was like no it's okay and then I'm like she just she just keeps going she's ran by she doesn't stop pause tell me anything she just just told me that I fell I'm running I'm going to finish the race and so I'm really concerned now because I mean that that was probably halfway through 
I'm like, you know, this is like 3.2 miles. It's like, you got more to go here. But she did. She came to the finish line fish. The, the blood had actually gone all the way down into her socks and like soaked her socks with, with blood. And she had little pebbles. I remember after little pebbles of rocks where she had fallen in the street somewhere. She said she got tangled up with a crowd of people. Feet got in the way. She fell. And, and I remember she had a little bit of blood on her hands where she caught herself. But I was like, man, I, I respect that. You know, that, that she, it doesn't matter if she's bleeding, it doesn't matter if she fell and she was in pain, she's going to finish the race. And I think how much more in the faith. I even got more respect for her uh, just, just in the last three, four years. She, she's run a couple half marathons, okay? That's 13.2 miles. That's crazy. Or 13.1, 26.2, sorry. All the runners are going to be on me after the service. Okay, 13.1 miles, okay? That's tough, folks. She runs that thing in like two hours. I'm like, seriously? And you know what happens to your body about mile nine or 10 when you're running that much? It says stop. It hurts. You can't breathe. You sweat out every ounce of moisture in your body that you have. Your hips hurt, your knees hurt, your feet hurt. The pounding of the pavement, your body is saying at mile nine, 10, stop. And then it's amazing that these runners say, no, no, I'm going to keep going. There's this thing that happens. They sometimes call it the runner's high. But it's like the endorphins and the adrenaline kicks in. And they're determined to finish. And I've seen my wife run for like two hours straight. I had a pretty good clip to finish those 13.1 mile half marathon races. And I'm like, wow. And then I read texts like Hebrews. And I'm like, that's the vision that the writer has for us is that we would run races of faith with determination like that that says not only am I going to finish I don't care if my knees are bloody not only am I going to finish I'm going to finish strong I'm going to finish well I'm not going to be last place I'm going to push and I'm going to go and I'm going to keep moving forward and so many times I think it is it is hard for us we, when we need to run these races, we're not running aimlessly. The path is marked out for us. We need to finish and finish strong in perseverance. The third thing this morning is that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. How do we do that? We make him the center, the most, the first, and the best in our life. We make him the center, the most, the highest, the first, and the best in our life. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Sometimes you got to focus on the end goal. Sometimes you need to focus on what's at the end. And if you read the whole book of Hebrews, there's one thing I think you would get out of the whole entire book, this theme of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is supreme. He is superior to all things in life, good things and bad things. He's superior to the challenges of life. He's superior to all the circumstances of life. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. He's better than anything you're dealing with in any situation that you face. Jesus is just better. And we need to, as Christians, lean into the superiority of Christ that gets us through and gives us courage to go on and stay in the faith. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is enough. And Jesus is better. And I want you to listen to these things this morning. Jesus is better than any website that you visit. Jesus is better than any relationship that you are in. Jesus is better than the new house that you're going to build Jesus is better than the car that you drive. Jesus is better than the vacation that you're going to go on this summer. Jesus is better than the biopsy that you're waiting on. Jesus is better than the bankruptcy that you're struggling through. Jesus is better than all of your friends on Facebook. Jesus is better than all of the likes you have on Instagram. He's better than being popular. He is better than getting that promotion at work. And he's better than anything that you can smoke, anything that you can eat, anything that you can drink. He is better than any lover, than any, any, any entertainer, any athlete, or anything else you would put up on a pedestal in your life. I'm telling you this morning that Jesus is better. And life in him is better. 
And I'm not saying that it isn't going to be a struggle at some time, at some points in life and at some times, but we need to fix our eyes on him and make him the center, the most, the highest, the first, and the best in our life. Because when we do that, we can finish the race of faith strong. And remember, what did he say? My burden, my yoke is light. It's easier than the weight of whatever this world tries to put on you. And folks, I believe that God wants us to run this race and to run free and to run well and to run strong. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 10, okay? So we've been in chapter 12 uh, most of today and most of the series. This is two chapters before that, uh, in the middle of that chapter. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. Listen to what it says here. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. And the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. And having our bodies washed with pure water. I mean, you read that that first verse there and you're like, wow, yes, that is what I need. Draw near to God with a sincere heart. Full assurance that faith brings. Of forgiveness of sins. Of eternal life someday. Of heaven. And then you get to verse 23, and he says this. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And I want to end today with a question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he who has promised is faithful? Because let me tell you something. If you don't accept that truth this morning, you're going to walk right out of God's church building this morning and right back into life, and you're going to feel tired, and you're going to feel anxiety, and you're going to feel scared, you're going to feel weary, you're going to feel worn out, and you're going to continue your life race either apart from Jesus or with this burden on your back that Jesus says, no, come to me. Run the race my way. I've marked it out for you. You know the direction in which you should go. Just ask for forgiveness from me and I will give it to you and I will run beside you all the rest of the way. Jesus would stand before you and say, fix your eyes on me. The author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And run your race. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And remember, Don't give up. Wherever you're at in your faith this morning, keep going. There are deeper things. There are better things. If you're outside of Christ this morning, you're like, man, I've been running a race, but it is away from Jesus. Hey, this could be a great day for you. This could be a great day because this could be the day where you repent and you confess and you accept Christ as your Savior and your Lord. Let's pray about that right now. Would you bow with me? Lord God, we come before you now, and God, I just pray. I want to begin, Lord, by praying, just just being thankful for Jesus, being thankful that you are a God that made him the sacrifice for our sins so that we'd have hope of eternal life with you. And not only hope, but hope of a deliverance of sins in the here and now. Hope of a process called sanctification, where we become more holy and more righteous and more like Jesus. God, you have called us to a race, this race of faith. We've read in in Hebrews chapter 11 over the last several weeks, these Bible characters that were men and women of faith. They were called to run their race, and sometimes they didn't even know where they were going. They didn't know how it was going to end. You've shown us your providence through it all in the lives of of people like Joseph. And God, now now we're facing our race. Satan says, no, 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 no. Go go your own way in life. You're your self-made person. And Lord, so many people buy the lie that life is somehow going to be better apart from you. But God, we know that it is only the true life, the abundant life that Jesus offers us is only found in you. And so, God, this morning, as we contemplate your word, as we contemplate the the Holy Scriptures this morning, I pray, God, continue to work in our mind and our heart. 
Help us to run our race of faith in such a way that we don't just finish or finish last or drag ourselves across the finish line, but Lord, we run the race with perseverance. And we run the race to win. And we run the race, and when we get sidetracked and we get bogged down and all of those hindrances come our way in life, God, we fix our eyes on Jesus and we remember that he beckons us. Don't give up. God, we thank you that we have a Savior like that. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We take this opportunity together just to sing and remember what is at the end of that race. Oh, how I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity.
you seated this morning. One of my favorite verses out of the book of Hebrews is what Eric read before we began to sing. I love it because it calls us to draw near and to hold. To draw near to God and hold on to our faith. So we come to a time to, to as we take communion together, in unity in the body of Christ. For me, that's what this moment is. For us to draw near to the heart of God. As we look at those emblems, we remember what Christ did, what he gave, his body and his blood for us so that we can one day rejoice with the saints who have gone before us. But it's also for us to hold on, to hold on to that truth, to center our lives, to center the moments from here until eternity on him. So as we take communion this morning, let's remember that. Let's draw near to his love and hold fast to the truth of our faith. As we continue um, in worship together this morning, we come to a time where we have the opportunity to give. And my hope is that you do. You truly see this as an act of worship. Because it's something we're called to do, is to trust God with every aspect of our lives. Not just the things we want to give him, which I hope that is our hearts, is to give out of what he's given us. But to give him everything to trust him with everything. So you can see on the screen at Oakwood, we've given you tons of different ways to do that. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to give. But I do, I encourage you this morning that you would give as an act of worship to our God. I also want to be able to say happy Mother's Day. Happy, happy Mother's Day. I love today because we get to celebrate moms. And I have one, and I think most of us here have a mom. But I love it because we get to see the image of God through our mothers. And that's what we get to celebrate. That's what we get to see. So today at Oakwood, we've tried to make something fairly easy for you. So if you're a mom out there, we have a little gift for you. We have some chocolates, and we've also made something, which I know you love to do, because my wife loves to do this, photo booths. I know dads, oh, I, I feel you, I totally feel you. Pictures are not my favorite thing, but, right, in love, we do this. So we have photo booths out there for you, opportunities for you just to share and to come together as a family, just to remember this day and to remember these moments as we just gather in his love. Um, but I'm gonna invite you, let's stand together. I'm gonna pray for us as we dismiss, as we get to go and be the hands and feet and the light and the salt to those around us 
Um, I do want to remind you that today, if the message has touched you, if you need someone to pray with, maybe it's just a circumstance, or maybe you're ready to make a decision. You're ready to give your life to Christ, any and everything to him. We're going to have some elders down front, some pastors um, and leaders who just want to pray with you, to be here for you. So let's bow together um, as we begin to dismiss. Father, I do thank you for these moments. I thank you for these times we can gather in your name because these opportunities are not able to happen all over the world. And I pray that we don't take for granted the truth of your love. Father, I pray that you would just be with the offering, be with what we give, that you would just multiply it and that you would go and just further your kingdom in our community, that you would further your kingdom in our state and in our nation and around the world, that you would be heard and that you would be known and that lives would be changed so that you can be glorified. Father, be with us as we step out into our work week, as we step out into these opportunities to show your light, that we would have the courage and we would have the strength to do what you've asked us to do. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Dismissed.